one, we are live. Welcome everybody to Siegel Talks uh, here at the Martini Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY at the City University of New York and in the city of New York. And um, as we, we all know, the city that has been hit so hard, the state that has been hit so hard, uh, more cases and dead than in countries in the world. Um, and uh, streets are empty. Uh, uh, we hear, um, we hear um, the fire engines and ambulances going up and down. Everything is closed. Everything that made New York City, New York City, the bars, you know, starting on with the great oyster bars in the 19th, 20th century, where people got together, talk, regardless of class and uh, status, you know, where this was so great about New York, the city life, the uh, uh, theater places, concert halls, everything is closed. Stores are closed and, um, and life as we knew it has almost uh, vanished and has changed and we are confined to our small spaces. So the world for ourselves has gotten smaller, but also in a sense, the global world has gotten smaller. We are connected for the first time and where we really feel it, everyone is connected on this planet, but it also got closer in the global world even though borders in our clothes, cities even encourage not to travel. States in America say, if you come from New York to Massachusetts, quarantine for 14 days. So um, things are changing, but it is a time where we need to hear um, um, from the world, from the global world. We have to think and act locally, but we have to think and have a global conscious and a good sense. And, uh, and uh, the Siegel Center has done it over the years. And uh, with our talks, we have people from Egypt, from uh, Lebanon, Taiwan, uh, uh, Germany, France, now with us, uh, Italy, um, Burkina Faso, and, and many, 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 many other countries where we need to hear uh, voices uh, from artists. We hear so much from politicians, as we ever say, virologists uh, and economic advisors, uh, spin masters, but what do artists have to say? We strongly believe that artists have a voice. They have been on the right side of history, the right side of progressive justice, and they will be also be on the right side this time. So we need to listen to them. We need to take it serious. And everybody in the arts has these questions. We want to hear what is on people's mind, but also for outside that for people, please do listen what artists have to say and what they tell us. It is significant, it is important. Normally they do it thinking on stage. They do thinking by doing, by showing. We don't have that, um, but uh, still we have their minds. And uh, we, so we will get a little insight. Today we have guests for the first time from France one of the great uh, countries of theater in the history of the world, um, a great, great, great tradition. And so we're speaking with two practitioners today who um, will tell us a little bit of what's going on um, in France. There's uh, Karen Ann, a singer, a songwriter, a producer, culturally uh, uh, um, in, engaged in, uh, in community in France and Arsène Le Ciel, who uh, runs a great theater in uh, Rennes, um, and Centre Dramatique, if I'm right, a national theater, and um, where he has done ex exceptional work. Um, both of them uh, uh, agreed right away uh, to, to talk to us. And so thank you for taking the time. What, it's six o'clock, I think, in France. And where are you both? Maybe, uh, Karen, you start, where, where are you? I'm, uh, I'm in Paris, in Montmartre, which is why you hear the bells, because I'm close to the Sacré-Cœur. And, um, we can hear, even though the windows are closed, I'm very close to the actual um, um, white um, uh, Sacre Coeur, you know, the sacred yes, white on, up on the hill. So I'm here with my daughter confined since uh, mid-March. Um, the first month was very, um, was very bizarre because it was silence all over. This is a very um, crowded, not necessarily my street, but the neighborhood. Uh, but it became, um, it was suddenly um, a wall of silence with streets that are used to have a lot of tourists and a lot of uh, families and a lot of kids running around that became um, completely empty. Um, the thing is that uh, where I live is, um, I would, Compare it to certain um, to certain neighborhoods of Brooklyn. It's there is a very strong community of parents, 
of kids that help each other. So very, very uh, quickly, we managed to create uh, different charitable ways to help people who have less comfort of uh, getting their groceries and getting what they need around the neighborhood. So there is a beautiful collectivity of help within the neighborhood and the community. Um, but it was very challenging. We'll talk about the how it could affect different fields um, in the arts or in the everyday living for artists around here. But the neighborhood uh, has changed a lot. I feel now after almost two months uh, that, um, I mean, no, after, sorry, six weeks or five weeks, five, I five. feel that, uh, yeah, five weeks. I, we, we don't know, time is sort of a maze here. I feel mm -hmm. that uh, there is more noise coming from the outside. There is more, there are people who got the habit of going outside for an hour for grocery shopping, for a walk to get some air, but the first month was quite a desert. Mm, it's well, true, it you. has changed a lot so these much, days. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, Karen, and you say that because I had the feeling since two or three days that something has changed and that people go much more out right now. So you have to know that in France, the lockdown was um, was really quite you know, severe as uh, we needed to fill out some forms in order to go out. And it was only for an hour a day. And it was only like three miles uh, from your, from, you couldn't go further than three miles. So it was very strict in a way. We had to, to adapt ourselves to these kind of rules that are quite unusual uh, for French people. <laughs> um, and for my part, I had a very different experience. Um, uh, the day we had to close the theater, um, I felt not that I should stay in Rennes, but get back to Paris in order to get closer to my family and join uh, my family. Uh, but I live in the center, it's in a very different district from Kerenan. Um, and the center, there are not so many people living here. It's mostly people working. And uh, it means that lots of people have left and the, 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 the whole district was quite deserted. There was no one for a while, except uh, hundreds of homeless people. I live in a street when there is a, a social association called uh, Emmaus that uh, tries to help support rescue homeless people. So they were all gathering here. So my first weeks were like in an apocalyptic uh, movie because uh, it could be 100 to 100 homeless people wandering uh, around and uh, all the neighborhood, all the area was really like, there was no one. Most of people have left Paris, went to the countryside, uh, went somewhere else. So in my neighborhood, like there was almost no one in the street. We are only two people in this building, like everybody's left. And mm -hmm. you could see this main street um, that was empty and only some people like ghosts actually haunting this this neighborhood and and talking alone and uh, it, there was something very uh, desperate and desolated when the whole thing started and in order to get organized you know it, it took some time so all this social association who have this these people needed some time to get organized and take care of them so now the situation is a bit different and they have people, uh, they have meals and every morning in the street, they, they provide meals and stuff for all these guys. But the first week was really something devastating because uh, although we are in a quite protected uh, uh, confinement, uh, it was very, it was really, yeah, it was very sad to see that this confinement would be that different for people that some of them will have, you know, two months in the countryside, whereas others uh, are gonna experience something like hell. And uh, that's my fear after the confinement because probably everybody feels that the others have the same experience, although all these experiences are, will be so different. And you would have people who would have lost someone. You would have people who have been like in holidays. Some other people are working crazy with a, uh, working online and, and doing, making school for their children and getting together in small places. So all the, all the thing is very disturbing because uh, we are living in such different experiences and we're in bubbles, everybody's in their own bubble and we don't really know what's going on for the others on the other side of the street or the other side of the neighborhood or the other side of the border. 
And uh, the first weeks especially were really not only frightening, but, but really disturbing because you could see a country after another uh, that everybody had to deal in such a crazy way when you saw these people in India, for instance, and then Africa, and then it starts somewhere else. And it was, I don't know, it's a very strange experience to be uh, in your own world and knowing, like, I have lots of foreign friends. And at the beginning, I had some friends in Spain explaining that in Madrid, they would take over ice skating places in order to put all the coffins because they didn't have morgues anymore. You know, these kind of images were so powerful that they were like, you know, taking all your imaginary and it was really hard to focus on something else. It was uh, daunting. Yeah, this is a, an incredible experience. Um, I heard in the news this morning and Karen Ann, maybe for you to answer, there have been some burning cars in some of the banlieues, the uh, suburbs of Paris. The mood uh, it, it's changing. I know Italy, we had to, uh, Marco and Ermana from Ravenna who said, we are normally anarchists, but strangely enough in Italy, people really stayed at home. They listened to the government, didn't go out in France. It was a bit different. People weren't listening. Now, I guess that I said, you have to go to your computer, print out a form, sign it and take it with you when you go out. And, uh, from the beginning, yeah. From, from the, the beginning, beginning, this was, yeah. Um, they really tried to contain it because the first... Um, the first time actually we were addressed by the government in order to create this confinement, this quarantine, this global quarantine, um, I don't think people actually realized how severe the situation was. Uh, what we should understand is that France is a country where um, some countries are very prepared for um, uh, viral and pneumonia diseases. I don't, I realize now that France in the hospitals wasn't one of them, which is why we lacked uh, so much, um, so many places in certain hospitals. And also there wasn't a balance between certain regions in France where there was a lot of space in the hospital, like in Aquitaine, and then other spaces in the East where people were just uh, going to the hospital and they, the hospital couldn't, couldn't take them in. So it was an emergency the confinement. So we had to sort of either stagnate or bring down um, the pandemic situation. So since after the first address, uh, the first time the government addressed um, the people, uh, there was an understanding of the confinement, but not an understanding of the emergency, they had to make it more severe. And in order to make it more severe, they decided to uh, create this document where if you do go outside, whether it's for groceries or to the doctor or to work, because you can still proceed with your work, very, very uh, few um, um, uh, situations of work were possible because you can't gather with, with with anyone for more than two meters so or one or one meter. So um, the, the, the document, the printed document was actually what made people understand the how severe the situation was and how what an emergency it was to create an actual uh, stagnation within the pandemic. But are there going to be unrest in Paris on the streets? Like, um, both, for both of you, um, if we heard this, there were like images of burning cars and- uh, This yeah, is actually, it's, it's also, a, it's something that in any chaos situation, I'm sure, and even in normal life, there's always, um, there are always suburbs or places Unfortunately, we're, we're people in suffering um, or in, in situations that we can't really, we're not getting get into it, express. And of course that around the world, we will hear about events um, that are extraordinary and not necessarily ordinary events. And burning cars is an extraordinary event. The, this is something that happens out of quarantine and will happen during quarantine. Yeah, okay. I don't even mm -hmm. think it's a subject. I think, yes, no. it's hard and it's tough and people uh, are going crazy, but I think uh, the same people who go who will burn car regardless when they have to um, um, demonstrate. So I think it, um, yeah, it's not connected yeah. with the and it's not connected with the COVID. No. It's not connected with the confinement. It's Absolutely. an accident that happened between the police and some people, but it's not connected. So connected, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, mm. it, it you shouldn't uh, think that. Because of the pandemia, some things start in the no. in the suburbs. There's nothing to do with it. It's just, uh, as Karen and said, it's just an accident. It's, That's it's good. That is, that is good. And actually, good yeah. in these places where you could fear, 
lots of things. I mean, people behave well, really. And they really pay attention Absolutely. and give them time to understand, but they did. And they're very responsible um, in these suburbs. It could have been, uh, you know, it could raise lots of issues and it didn't. And I think people and communities and associations and just people did a great, great effort and, uh, and they really managed well. So it shouldn't be shadowed by, by these accidents that could have happened anytime, anywhere. Yeah, no, Absolutely. I think we yesterday had uh, Basil Jones from South Africa who said South Africa is actually doing remarkably well, very it's prepared, a very good president to take steps. They closed all the tobacco and alcohol shops because they felt uh, respiratory problems shouldn't be reinforced and the people for domestic violence reasons shouldn't have access to it. And he says it was unimaginable, but somehow seems uh, things seem to be working even though they are here and there um, signs of, of an unrest. But um, Arthur, um, when it came to, to France, um, Nicole Berman and uh, Laurent Clavel at the French Cultural Services in, in, in New York also said, you know, talk to, to um, uh, Arthur. And so tell us a little bit about your theater and then what you do and uh, how is the situation there? You also lead a school and how did you react to all of this? What happened? Um, okay, uh, we have 70 people working in the theater. It's quite a big institution. It's one of the biggest actually that is devoted for theater, but for some reason, um, through history, I would say, we could manage to also invite, produce uh, uh, dance pieces and music. And that's why Kerenan is also associated to this, uh, to this theater. Um, and uh, there's a national school. There's also a movie theater and an international festival. So it's a, it's a huge setup that of course uh, will suffer a lot from what is going on because when it comes to international production, right now everything's stuck because we don't know if people can, you know, who's gonna leave its country? How can we travel? And uh, uh, we need to manage the school. We need to, uh, I would say that my, the first thing was actually to understand and figure out how to get and to stay in touch with the people working for the theater. It's 70 people who were waiting and didn't know what to do and how things are gonna evolve. So you decided to close down the theater or how did it work? We had to, it was, so, um, it was not in a choice. Uh, first- You got a phone call, an email, or um, how did that work? Um, was progressive. They started to send out protocols to theaters and cultural places and concert places to little by little um, try to have the people working from their homes and then until we can actually do a, a close down, which was over the weekend of the 12th, 13th, Friday the 13th of it's just uh, that, March. Yeah, as, as, as you say, it's, it's, first we were not allowed to have more than 1,000 people in the theater, then it was 100. Uh, but as I was traveling, because I was in Italy on tour and I was in Bologna performing the day they, 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 they locked down Bologna. And then I had- What to did you perform? What was your show? Uh, it was, I was just acting in a piece um, written and staged by a French playwright and director called Pascal Rambert, Pascal who came Rambert, quite often in, in yeah. New York. Uh, and I was acting in his play and it was called Architecture. And it was about, uh, it was actually the last line was, why did you say we needed to get ready for times we could not even think about? Which was like a prophecia of something that we're, but, and we, we actually, it was the last show in Bologna because they had to stop the festival and lock down the city. And then the next day I was supposed to be in France for Camille that I had staged about a woman dying of pneumonia. And, um, and uh, we went in Luxembourg and the day we opened in Luxembourg, there was only half, half of the house was full, although it was sold out because the day before they started to speak of the COVID in Luxembourg. It was from, from a day to another. First, they didn't speak about it. And all of a sudden they started to speak about it and say that people needed to stay at home and this kind of things. So we had our opening in Luxembourg. And at the end of the show, the director came and say, I'm sorry, but we need to close the theater. So tomorrow you won't perform. And then we are supposed to go back to France and perform. And all the theater were sending emails saying, don't worry, Arthur, we'll, we'll get the show, no problem. But in the meantime, that's why when you ask, how did I, did I find out? 
I don't even remember because it was a mix of phone calls, emails, friends talking. And as we were touring in Europe, we could see from one country to another that all these places were shutting, you know, so closing down. So we were getting ready and waiting with lots of anxiety the day when we would be told by the Ministry of Culture, now you have to, to close the theater. And for two weeks, it was mostly administration, organization, how are we gonna make it work? Uh, will people get paid? How does that work? You have to know that we are in a country when luckily there are lots of subsidies, subsidies for art and culture. So our institution it is a public theater. It means that we don't only depend on the box office. Um, most of the money comes from subsidies from the government, from the region, from the city uh, in order to and it was a very ideological and, and political project at the end of the Second World War. It was the idea of creating that network all over France, asking artists to run some companies and institutions in order to create a demanding work and demanding culture, but to make it accessible for the largest audience. Um, and subsidies help us first to create and develop new works and to take risks and to make art or I mean, or more experimental forms, but on a larger scale. And the other part of the subsidies are actually for the audience because uh, people are gonna come and see a show in our theater will pay maybe 15 euro. So, you know, the money has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So this, this public network um, supports artists, but also supports the audience and allow an audience, allow people who could not afford going to a theater to go. So mm -hmm. we also <clears> work <throat> um, with lots of association and, and, and people in order to bring these people in our, in our theaters. So anyway, the government said at the beginning that they would support uh, either firms or corporates, but also the public services in order to make them work. So our situation is bad, but it may be not as bad as in other countries. Uh, yeah. When I speak with my American friends and American actors, it's just, there's nothing, really nothing. Um, so we've been encouraged by the government, for instance, to, to pay what we had to pay when we had to cancel a production. We were supposed to have a few shows uh, till June and we had to cancel maybe seven or eight performances, uh, shows, I would say seven or eight shows but we paid everything. So artists get paid, technicians were paid, and, um, and we tried not to cancel uh, all these shows, but to postpone them. And to, um, we paid also for all the people who were on tour with our productions, although the tour was stopped. So we needed to find some, some ways to make sure that during that time, people could get you know, their money or would be sure that their shows would be presented in the next season. So of course we had to juggle and jeopardize the season in order to, to make it work now. But that's lots of people are gonna be canceled anyway. It's just a new puzzle. Mm. But um, still it shows that a, a theater that is supported by the state for artists, but also for audiences can deal better with it than a co purely commercial theater like a Broadway system. Okay. But we have Karen, Karen, and how did you experience that how is it for you with your career as a musician and singer? Do you have, is, are you have any gigs coming up? Do people pay you or did they, what, what's, uh, what's- So I was on tour. I was actually on tour. Uh, the night they announced the beginning of the confinement on March 12th, I was playing, I was on tour with my musicians. Um, I had about 30 shows to come like around uh, with the summer of between 25 and 30, not only shows, but also events. and. Um, and uh, we knew it was coming. We didn't know exactly when. And then at some point about two weeks before, I think they moved, uh, it was from five, no more than 5,000 people and then no more than 1,000 people. So we canceled all the shows that uh, were supposed to be for over 1,000 people. And then we kept the ones that are under 1,000. And on March 12th, they said that it was over, that you can't gather at all like under a hundred but it was just for another few days but we knew it. so we had to cancel everything um the thing is that some of the shows were in theaters and in concert halls that are supported by the government but most of them were also there were many shows that were in rock clubs and festivals 
um, when it came to, th there is a whole issue here that we can address or not, but there was something uh, in terms of uh, anything that has to do with rock shows that had to do with insurance contracts uh, that has been done in December, all the contracts that have been signed before December 20th, um, uh, recognized COVID within Force Majeure and all the contracts that have been signed after December 20th uh, were not recognized. Uh, you, need a, you needed a special, um, um, you needed to address uh, the, the uh, COVID as a special case. It was not under Force Majeure. So this, is a, this was a very complex thing. And then we realized very quickly that many independent promoters, which I work with, like Caromba and Rain Dog Production, which are wonderful, passionate uh, producers who love projects and invest time and money in projects. And then I realized how, uh, what a hard thing it's gonna be for them. Uh, so, I also saw the difference of how it is between musicians and technicians. Um, musicians who accompany, for example, for example an, uh, a project, an artist. I mean, I know that I work under my own name, but I hire a crew a lot with me on the road. It's a collaboration when it comes to stage, but it's still in a way that there are musicians, there, is, um, there are technicians. Some of them do have a lot of help from the government. Um, some of the concert halls that are supported by the government are gonna be able to honor a lot of their salary when it comes to both. And some of them can't because they're independent. And I work with uh, different uh, independent promoters that are gonna have a very, very hard time. Of course, they won't be able to honor the payments there even in laws. And um, as much as they're filling in, and I think we're learning, I think every day we have a little bit more information from the Minister of Culture on how to support these independent promoters. Uh, when it comes to uh, musicians and artists, it really depends on each case. I don't think, uh, I, I, I do think that they're gonna get helps, but it's not the priority right now, which is something I do understand and I'm not looking for priority, I'm happy. Uh, that the people I work with and the people that depended on this tour and on this year to come, because it's a year of touring. We don't know um, that the tour was for a year. So I'm just giving my example, but it's there are mm -hmm. other artists uh, that had way more shows than me. And uh, we're talking about, um, in my case, between uh, around 30 people who um, had a year of plans of tours. Um, some of the options that we had for the fall had to be moved away because what we canceled here is going to the fall and so on. And then maybe the fall is not even going to take place. So we're talking about spring 2021. So I think for all of us, the priority was to find ways uh, to have cultural content because for our sanity, we thought we knew that at some point we'll find ways to monetize it and there will be a collectivity of help. And what's necessary right now is how to translate what we do into something that is cultural. Uh, so all, I know that many friends of mine and many artist friends of mine, their first instinct was to give content of music and art and poetry and theater and readings online that were accessible um, um, with uh, no fee. I know I, I do that every night at 10 p.m. on my Instagram page, but I mean, you can access through different and I have other friends who do it. Um, and I think artists also decided to do it a lot around the world, but in France, I, from what I understand, um, they're very, very fast. There was a lot of content from, from all different fields of arts. Also, um, personally, and I can only talk for myself, um, I work when I write and compose and, and write songs or other things, I work from um, uh, a relation that is distant to the emotion. For example, if I had to work on a project now, I would be addressing things that I have already lived and experienced. I need the distance. Um, and I found myself in a place where I'm unable to create at all, because the only thing I could work on is music for somebody else's vision, for a play or for dance, but it's not coming from me. Like songwriting or writing in general comes from a place of 
uh, re-experiencing an emotion that you've already lived. And since what we're going through right now is so big and so intense, and I absolutely put myself on standby when it comes to writing new material. I find that maybe in the future, I'll be able to readdress it and come back to it. But right now I can't address any sort of uh, emotional expression that what we call a creative way of, of in, in, in my world. And I had to let go. So for me, working on content that is already existing, working on projects, thinking about future projects. Some of them I have with Arthur, some of them with other collaborators, some of them are mine trying to, to work on things that I have in progress that already have a shape, but uh, I'm unable, bizarrely enough, and I'm un unable to read. I'm, I'm a, I read a lot in everyday life and for a month I wasn't able to open a book. Uh, there is a whole standby and the reason I'm saying this is not just to talk about myself is because when I share and when I talk to other fellow artists, I feel that they're in the same situation of standby. Oh, and yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and this, um, I think there is an intense complex. Um, I read an article, a very interesting article from the Har Harvard Business Review uh, <clears throat> about David Keller's work in research for anticipated, um, anticipated uh, uh, grief. And I feel that even if now we're starting to understand and contain more information, the more we know in terms of research about this pandemic, the more also it becomes something that we can contain because not knowing is a very, very strange uh, situation. And in France, I felt that there was a collectivity of anticipated grief. People were grieving something they don't know. People were losing their elders. People weren't able to go uh, to... Um, um, uh, hospices in order to say goodbye to their loved ones because there was this protocol of staying distant and there was like a co like collective grief constant constant grief and I think the more we're going to be able to put names on things and a physical form and words on what's actually happening um, the more artists are going to be able to uh, actually take their ideas and create new stuff but as of now, I feel that people are okay with just letting it in and working on things that already exist, maybe reviewing them, um, sort of going back to them, trying to work on, on classics. I feel that many of my friends agree that uh, diving into classics within theater or poetry or, or music uh, have comfort because you feel that the experience is coming from uh, other eras where they have already lived um, extraordinary events and they have already experienced them. And we need their uh, witness. I mean, we, it's yeah. like a witness. Mm -hmm. We need their input in order to understand it. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, quite stunning to hear that someone like you says, I can't read, I can't write, I can't sing uh, really or, comp or create. Um, Arthur, how is it for you as an artist? Exactly the same thing. I mean, I really relate to what Karen has just said. And um, the beginning with the theater, dealing with the theater at first was quite complicated because uh, on an intimate way, I was experiencing something like that, like this grief, um, this despair. And it was really hard to find the words in order to find the right words to, to, to explain to our team uh, what is going on, how are we going to work now, and what are we going to do in the future, when you don't even have the time to process it for yourself. It's really hard to find the, the, the right line in order to, to, lead, uh, to lead this project with uh, all these people working with uh, us. What do you feel as an artist? So what, how is it for you? Exactly the same thing. And actually, it was, um, it was really difficult to focus on something uh I, I i was feeling that my concentration was the concentration of of a, of a goldfish um because my mind was always caught by what was going on and i think there is that grief absolutely and our imaginary was taken by something that was in the air but i think also something really wild really animal really something from i don't know which era was taking over on our uh, something yeah i think i was like a like an animal 
it was not rational. It wasn't in my brain. It was something in my body that was always on the lookout. Uh, you don't know what exactly and what you were afraid of, but there was this um, attention um, all day long for everything, even for the silence. Everything was unusual. And uh, it was unusual to go in the street when you may be not supposed to be in the street. It was unusual to give a form to a police guy because you're out in your neighborhood it's unusual to stay away from people when you're in the grocery store it's unusual to arrive by the louvre or and there's no one it's unusual to see all these people uh, uh sleeping in the street so it was really hard just to to go back to yourself say hey i'm gonna do something i'm gonna create i'm gonna be super creative i'm gonna write poetry, I'm going to write my memory, I'm going to write my journal, the journal of my confinement, which a lot of people are actually uh, exposing right now, which I think is a bit weird. Um, and I completely relate to what uh, Karen Ann just said. So the thing is that it was interesting as a uh, first as, as uh, me as an artist, I was on, on the way to, to start rehearsing a new play. And I now would be in rehearsal right now. Rehearsal What's the play? Me. It's called uh, Brothers, My Brothers. Uh, it's written by this playwright, Pascal Rambert, who wrote me for me as a stage director. And he wanted me to stage that script that he wrote for five people. Um, it's quite astonishing because that play that I read a year and a half ago, uh, I, I really loved it because it was out of the context, out of any context. You have to know that these last years, what has really grew in France is this kind of, a kind of documentary theater, um, something about how to speak of the world right now and with real people on stage, you know, and I respect that. There are lots of shows like that. But I love that play by Pascal because it was actually like a fable. It was like a dark fairy tale about men and women, but men, men in their, more violent way of dealing with nature and with their future. It's about people being isolated, confined in a very remote place in the north of Europe, in the forest, and they destroy everything around them. And it's like a fable about destruction, about this uh, manhood destruction and how people cannot cope or how are species, human species cannot cope with nature and their environment and express it by violence and everything. But it was like a dark fairy tale. It was an anticipation. It was something about the future. And, and I was happy with that because I say, okay, it would be nice to have something that is not connected with uh, the news. And uh, it's really strange because when we're going to go out and if we have the possibility to stage it, then all of a sudden it's going to resonate a lot with our experience. And strangely enough, the costume that were designed and, and were made actually look like the costume that some people have right now in some supermarkets with the plexiglass hat and you know these kind of things. So now it's the show has become like a response to what we are actually experiencing. But the most interesting um, in terms of intimacy, I would say is that it felt that we would have had to project and, and go through a, a very strong imaginary uh, uh, process in order to tell the story. But right now, what is interesting is that the actors and the audience would have experienced was at stake in the play, which is confinement, isolation, and the end of this world. So instead of being a futuristic fable, uh, it becomes an experience that everybody just had. So mm. I don't know how, I don't mean, I don't mean I'm going to, I don't feel I could change anything. It's just that people will listen to it in a very different way. Different way. And us as actors on stage, we will be much more connected with the words and much more grounded in the reality of, of this experience. And, at some point, I was thinking, okay, maybe it would be very hard to, to, to create shows in the future. And uh, if I had to choose one thing that I would like to do, what would make sense? And at the beginning of the confinement, I was not so sure. But right now, I'm sure that it's that play. 
And it's beautiful in a way because I have this necessity now of, of doing it because I know that there will be this encounter between what's going on on stage and the few people that might be in the house because we don't know how many people will be allowed to, to, to have in a house in the, in the next month or in the next year. So, and this opened also a new way of thinking the life of that theater in the future because for a while I was supposed to deal with the theater right now. What are we supposed to, to do? What are we, what would make sense to, for such an artistic and cultural place in a city like Rennes, what would make sense for the people? And what is a theater without shows and without an audience? What, what, what is the purpose of that? So I had to answer that question right now. And we found some, I think, interesting answers, but we also have to ask these questions now for the future. So there's two different aspects of it. It's now, what are we doing now in order to keep it alive and to, and to maintain that connection between the artists, the audience and the people working in the theater. But what are we gonna do at the fall if we cannot have an audience? Uh, and what will be the purpose of our houses? So um, what I've decided now also is because there was a huge pressure at the very beginning. Everybody felt that we had to do something online and that we all had to use this digital technical stuff, right now, right now, and provide content. And I was like, yeah, sure, but what content? I don't even understand what's going on. I don't understand what's going on with me. I don't understand what's going on in that neighborhood. So how will I provide something that makes sense online right now? And it took me a while. It took me a while because I had to find what would make sense for me. And first, I would say that with my team, we thought that the first thing to do was to think not for an audience who's used to come for the theater, but also for the audience that doesn't often come to the theater or comes with a, some association and network for, you know, for disabled people, for far people, from people who have, you know, from a different background that are not used to come for the theater and not lose the connection the, the trust and what we built with some association and some communities in this moment. So first thing was, can this theater through the website become like a platform for any solidarity ideas, any, uh, any supports and help and any ideas that people may have in order to get together and in order to help some people who would need some help and assistance. So we started that way and um, um, then there was another simple idea. We have a movie theater and this movie theater now is online and you know it's on demand. People can pay to watch a movie. So we managed to get what people will pay will be transferred to some association in Rennes who, um, who bring meals to homeless people, for instance, things like that. Very simple things, very- So you show things in your movie theater, people pay a symbolic fee and it helps people to be fed. Yes. And, do you do your uh, discussions, the ones with Patrick uh, Boucheron? The one, is that going on? This is, a, this is something else. And uh, just to finish with the solidarity. Yep, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Also, we, what we started, it took us a while, but I'm very happy and proud of it. Now the, we use the workshop, uh, the costume workshop, and, uh, to, 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 to make masks because there's a lack of masks in France. So um, we sew and we have a team sewing masks and preparing masks. Uh, for the city. So we bring them to the city hall and they'll be spread for all the people working for uh, the city right now and in hospitals and things like that. So what, our main physical activity at the theater right now is to make masks, actually, which is, I think... Which is an old thing. tradition in theater, but in a completely <laughs> different <laughs> sense. You yeah. say that it's not Italian <laughs> masks, or, uh, but it's just, yeah. And the other thing about uh, Boucheron came from uh, something very intimate. In the, was I was at the very beginning, I was obsessed with news. I was always online and, and reading and checking news. And uh, it was devastating, actually. And then what was very powerful also was to feel something that was really hard to express because it's so huge that some sometimes it's not really thinkable. Uh, it's the 
it, that that thing that is happening is in the whole world, and that we're almost now five billion people uh, experiencing that thing, and it's the very first time in our generation, I think that we experience something like that, and. I felt that I needed to feel related with the rest of the world because what we were experiencing was not only our national uh, way of dealing with the virus. It was not the national pandemia. It was a worldwide uh, pandemia. So it was something important in the story of humanity. And, uh, and I felt very connected. Um, and I, I needed to feel connected. I needed to feel that everything that was happening I would. I, I wish. I was actually looking online for some news in in the rest of the world, and I couldn't just be satisfied with your news here. It was. I don't know. To. Anyway, so, and also because I was hearing lots of people saying, "Oh, now it's finally the end of globalization. It's the end of globalization. We're we're done with that." And I was thinking that's a strange way of thinking about it because globalization. It has always existed. Uh, the Roman Empire was globalization. We're all the product of this globalization. And, and in a way, you know, there were not only viruses that came from China to Milano. In the 14th century, it was uh, the silkworm. And that's how silk started in Italy uh, from China. You know, it was the same journey. So I remember that book. Uh, that Patrick Boucheron is one of the more interesting and, and main historian now in France. And uh, he's actually associated with me at the theater. As I arrived in the theater in two years or three years ago, I asked Patrick to be part of our project because um, we've had experienced very complicated things in France uh, these last years, especially with the bomb attacks and the terrorism and what happened in the Bataclan and everything. And we were in a time when we needed to process things and think about the unthinkable and try to put words on it and, and, and reinvent uh, something in our society. So that, you know, that, that way of thinking of these discussions were, had started, unfortunately, um, since all these events that have happened in France in, in these last year. And, and so Patrick was associated with the theater and in order to, to bring something about his story, uh, echoing our season and echoing what the theater was providing uh, in terms of content. And he was in a way reinterpreting it in the, with, through the, the lenses of his story. And he created that book that is a marvelous book called uh, uh, The Worldwide uh, National History of France. Um, it's like how the national uh, story, history and story of our country is, is a storytelling, is a fiction that of course each country is doing, but how uh, we cannot think about our national history separated from the rest of the world. And our national history is completely connected with the rest of the world. And he created that book with 30 other historians. And it goes from prehistory to 2015 and the Bataclan. And, uh, and you go through all these dates. And it's so fascinating to see how we are made of and how our history has always been connected with all the other countries. And, and because our story is full of wars, colonizations, uh, uh, will of power, it's also connected with not only these negative things, but it's also connected with the search for another, a search for encounters, with discovery, with experiences, with traveling, with fight. Um, so there is this huge energy um, in the book, there are all these discoveries that we make from one date to another because it's it's built, you know, through maybe more than a hundred dates uh, from um, minus fifty thousand to two thousand fifteen. So our idea was to choose and select, uh, and Patrick did it. He selected fifty interesting dates, and we asked. 
actors and actresses and artists who were supposed to be in the season, who were in the season, who are connected with our theater to read them every day. So we recreate this huge community and it, it's quite moving because it's a huge community. Mm -hmm. And you do readers. that now too, during the, uh, is there something going on right now in the- Yes, it has started a week ago. Oh, oh you start that right now. We, oh, it's We started it a week now. ago and, uh, and it's quite beautiful because it's such different voices and such different personalities who read and they do the best <laughs> the best they can with quite difficult texts because they haven't been written to be told. It's written by historian. It's, you know, it's a very serious book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's research. It's not, you know, entertainment. So they're really hard. They're, they do a really hard job in order to make it clear. And, and it's so fascinating because they're very engaged in these readings, but because these stories are so fascinating and you find out that the Islam is present in France since the 8th century. And there have always been lots of things that came out of that for the better and the worse. But it's interesting to remember the better. It's interesting to remember that uh, the, the, the heart of Judaism in Europe at some point was in France in 1000, in the center of France somewhere, with the main mm -hmm. leader and thinker of Judaism, Rashi. It's fascinating to think that Dunkerque, which is such a desperate city in the north, had been one of the most cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan yeah. uh, city in the world in the 17th century, that they've been one day in Dunkerque, where Dunkerque was Spanish in the morning, French in the afternoon, and English in the evening. Um, Incredible, yeah. Things like that. And it's so fascinating because we are made of all this huge connection and discovery and exploration, colonization, but it makes this um, metissage. Oh, I don't remember the name in English, Karen, and the metissage. Blend? Or like, Blend. I don't know how yes, to sure. yeah, use Melting, metissage. the melting. Yeah. We're such, we're, uh, France, it's not France. <laughs> France is just a blend of so many countries and culture and, and mix of people. And how, yeah. how, how, how interesting to think that instead of saying we put on a cabaret act or we, you know, do something or we show our shows we have done, which also I think is a very important thing to you say, let's engage with the history of, uh, and of also, France and put it out. And, um, and, and something uh, you can listen to because there were lots of things to watch, but sorry, there are people who work on the computer for hours, then they have to make school for their children. Then they have to prepare three meals a day and, and two laundries. And not everybody has three <laughs> computers in the house yeah. and it's just one. And, and who can sit and watch a, cap a show for three hours? Karen, Ooh. how is it for you? How do you cope with this? What are your, no, are I, you mean, I have one, I have a do one daughter, but I have friends who have three. I have one daughter and she's magic. So it's been even with schooling and everything. So I can't complain, but I know some people for, for um, that are having a, um, um, having a very complex time, you know, it's three different classes, ages, programs, they need to work from home. Um, they, it's, uh, I'm sure, as Arthur said, people are going to have different experiences. And uh, like in any experience that the world is going through, I'm very concerned about how um, it, we're going to um, take care of it on a European level, because I think some countries are more built to help their, uh, to help people individually and others don't have the budgets and the possibilities. I wanna know that there is a collectivity within Europe because as Arthur said, we learned from history, history has showed us that when we close our borders and, um, and um, each country becomes independent in times like this, it's a very dangerous thing. That's what happened after the first world war and it led to atrocities. So I'm hoping there will be um, a, a, a good engineering of collectivity within Europe and within the US. I'm just separating the two because right now it's two different um, entities uh, in decision-making. So I feel that on a European level, um, there should be a gradual building, rebuilding. It's gonna be long. We know very little. We don't know for how long we're gonna need to go back and forth within this confinement. We don't know for how long 
um, the arts are going to be something accessible only online. And um, I think what's important in times like this is uh, solidarity, which is especially within theaters and and uh, places that create and that um, deliver the arts, because it's also time to relate this to education. Our kids may have access right now to art and culture online. We don't know for how long. And uh, it's, it's, we're gonna have to learn how to transmit uh, as many things as possible for their education like this for a little while. With how do idea, you, um, mm -hmm. sorry, Frank, we've decided sure. regarding this question, because right now we're using everything online, we put what exists, and I think so many things have been produced this last year, so it's quite beautiful to have this opportunity now to, uh, to rediscover some shows sometimes, if we have time to listen to lots of uh, radio broadcasts, and there are amazing stuff that have been done these last years, and thanks to some uh, institution, we have the possibility now to reconnect and, and rediscover so many things we didn't have the time to listen to. But I think at the fall, my, my I don't know if it's uh, a decision or a desire, maybe uh, this desire will become a decision soon. If we cannot open the theater at the fall, then we need to open it to artists. If we cannot get an audience in the theater, we need to have artists uh, inhabiting it. And, and maybe we won't have the possibility for lots of months to present shows, but I think we need to create things. And maybe someday there will be people to see them because theater, it, it's only about and music also, but let's say theater, it's really about being in the same moments and in the same space uh, with people on stage and in the house and, and something is happening, which is living, which is alive, which is this performing living art. So even if the theater is closed at the fall, then it should be open for people, artists, ideas. And I think we're gonna use the, the space, the empty space in order to, to dream and prepare the future. Uh, but I mean, people come common. inside and sleep in their rooms or stage and work that inhabiting space. Yes, why not? Why not? And uh, we, we use it for the, the in Rennes, there are many different rooms um, for many different forms of uh, creation. There is uh, the possibility totally to um, do workshops and stay there. And I mean, even within artists and exchange and write together and bring in artists from uh, different fields blend as much as possible within the arts. That's uh, it's the, the uh, TNB is very well built for collaborations. Is it a time to completely rethink what we do? I mean, uh, Avignon, for example, is canceled, which of course is a big, uh, significant, the most beautiful celebration of theater, but also the names that come in and uh, so many out there, but it also has been done like in this way for a long time. It was created after World War II, also after a time and there was a big hunger for culture, but do things have to be radically reimagined? Are you reimagining things at Ren as something that you say we now have to react to that time or do you think, no, we should focus on what's good and what we know, what will work? Well, my first move was what I just said is like, it's to create anyway. Like if I cannot do my brothers at the fall with an audience, I will do it anyway without an audience. <laughs> I will perform in an empty space with all these ghosts. But I think uh, that something might come out of it. I think it would, it would be, a, it's very difficult to figure out what, because it's gonna be the result of, of so many things that we are going through, as Kerenan just said before. We need to go through it. And, uh, and then, well, and I, I think it's interesting to get, to give us ourselves the possibility to take time not to rush on new ideas because we're not obliged to have new ideas. Yes. And like, when we have all these questions now, I have interviews like, how can you imagine, what do you imagine when you go out? How do you imagine it's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Mm. I don't know. And, yeah. and in a way, I don't wanna know. And the, the best thing I did these last days was to, to drop it, to, to just give up on, on this and just let go. 
I don't know. The only thing we need to do right now is to be flexible. And as Bruce Lee said, be like water and go with uh, what's going on. Because I think if we aim too much or if we decide too much, probably we're going to lose something or probably we won't have the full experience. What we need to go, what you need to do is to go through it with a stream and, and we'll meet people and we'll talk with people and we'll try things and things we don't even know probably will come out of it but it won't happen if we decide what we want what we see or what we think people will expect how should we know and i think we should be much more humble than that and just just uh, experience and 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 you know there have been so many shows that were produced i think it's sad if we close our theater for a season it's super sad if we cancel avignon and I'm sad for the artist, I'm sad for all this, I'm sad for the audience. But on the other hand, maybe it's nice to have this moment on hold. Like, okay, we all say that, oh, it's nice to make the stop. It's nice that playing stop. It's nice that we stop, you know, and, and, and by close. It's, not, it's, it's nice that we stop, we stop. Okay, we can stop doing things for a little while. It's okay. It's okay not to have ideas. It's okay not to... Uh... So for not the to moment... Produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... And if we have to remount some shows, if we have to the time to, to think about how we were doing things and what we didn't like in the way we were doing things and, and just the time to think how we would like to do them now, then it would be nice. But if we don't stop, we will never think and we will never take the time to, to, to not only to think for yourself, but to share it with the others. I don't know if it's clear, but... It's I am no. It's very clear. It's a very beautiful um, approach, I believe, what you just said. Yeah, yeah. It's. Um, I mean, Sahar um, Asaf in Lebanon said it's best. She said she had a hard time, but she said now let's all be okay with that. We don't produce. We all are in a rush. We do so much. I say just be there, uh, be in the moment, and uh, experience this. Luigi Calamari, the Italian playwright, said she wrote a poem which got her into trouble in Italy and where she then said, let's throw everybody out of the window who already writes the play about Corona and uh, uh, yeah, writes the Netflix. She says, I don't want to hear yeah. about it. And no. she says, I can't do anything. I move objects around all day. One or two hours, I might be able to do something. Milo Rao, uh, uh, which is interesting, and Gantz said, with like a little manifest, he said, well, I think I'm planning the season will not happen in Ghent. And if it happens, let's imagine it as if it will not happen. We, let's do everything outside in factories and schools, in buildings, that it's not the theaters that we find a new way, reconnect, uh, be activists as refugees. Who knows, you know, what... Um, what will will come out um, yeah, yeah, a little bit over time. I'm so sorry yeah. to interrupt. I have a, a, another live show that I have to prepare to that I'm invited to it, and it's in 10 minutes. Yes, of um, course. So thank so you for I just, having us here. Thank you so much for sharing uh, this moment to talk about what's going on in, in our country. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, thank you. And we are really interested and thank you, you know, for this was an important um, insight. Maybe the last question to Karen very fast. What do you do then to to keep you going, to your batteries? What do you do in your uh, day? Well, I do, uh, I try to do as many activities with my daughter. I try to look more into the educational uh, uh, aspect of this because maybe this is something that I will go more and more to workshops online and uh, sharing things about the, the, the writing, the songwriting, the production. I do a live session every night on my Instagram page. Um, it's uh, my Instagram is Karen Ann Music. Every night at ten, I mm -hmm. read letters that people send to an email address called Days of Confinement two thousand and twenty at gmail dot com. They they write letters to loved ones that are quarantined far away from them and around the world. And I just read their letters. We have artists coming in. Irene Jacob comes every Sunday to read some poetry. Uh, she comes in virtually, you know. But mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, we create communities that need certain contact at certain times of day and it helps go through this. And we feel that we have a schedule for something and it's important to keep busy. And I cherish the time I have with my daughter and I try to take it in um, as softly and as serenely as possible. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, really quite a big, big good, advice, good advice, a lot that you're doing. So thank you really for sharing and good luck. Thank you for having me. It's Love to all, Love to. We'll, we'll speak Bye -bye. very soon. Bye. Thank you, Frank. It was really Thank nice you, to join you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe, um, Arthur, for you as a, as a final question, um, we do have, of course, a lot of young artists, young 
Arthur Nortis yells, you know, when you were a student or whatever at the time, listening now um, some classes and, uh, and artists in general, whether they might be in New York or in, in New Delhi or, or in Bangalore or um, in anywhere in the world. What, what would you say as a, someone who's also a teacher, you run also the school, which you have to deal with also uh, with all of it. What, what, what is your advice as a working artist? <laughs> it's very difficult to uh, the, because the more you grow, you, you, the less you want to give advices, right? You yeah, understand yeah. that yeah. life is such a journey. Um, I think it's it's really. Uh, I think what's really useful it's to think that it's not about recognition, it's not about existing. It's how, through your art, you also build yourself. And never forget that you'll become, uh, through years, the man, the artist, the woman, the artist. You will be through all these choices that you're going to make and that all your encounters, all your choices uh, will finally create the person you will become. So it's just to stick to what you really believe in and uh and yeah in a very straight straightforward and honest way and in this corona time what would you think would be a way to prepare for them or to be to be, what oh it's so it's so difficult to, to to say something general because i think I, I i see that with our students there are 20 and it's 20 different experiences some of them are very lonely in a very tiny studio, isolated from everybody. Some others are with their family, some other in big houses in the countryside. And it's just so different. And I think, and maybe it's not an answer to your question, but uh, I think what people should not forget when we go out and after the confinement is to remember that we all had very different experiences and be very respectful and careful about the others. Because even if we had a great time, some other people, you know, still haven't buried their grandparents. So we should not forget about the fact that we'll, be, we'll have to be very delicate uh, because we all forget that we're, we're stuck in our places and with our computers and uh, our vision of life right now is through that screen or through our windows, but it's not real life. And we have no idea actually about what was really going on. We just have uh, a virtual idea or we just have our imagination or we have the news, but we don't really know. And uh, so I think, and it's beyond work, or if you have a work to do, it's to get ready to to discover what we have to discover and also how to reconnect with people who will have such different experience. And I think before work, what will take us together is how are we gonna be together? Like uh, if we have to respect that social distance, for instance, it's so strange right now, if you meet some friends or if for some reason you need to see someone and I had to take care of someone of my family and uh, it's so strange because you cannot hug, you cannot get close to people. This is something that is really new. How are we going to experience that? How are we going to look at each other in the street and not be scared by people? How are we going to deal with the distance? How are we going to deal with all these different experiences? And I think we will need, and I don't know if it's going to happen, some kind of social or national ritual in order to to meet again and to join again, it won't be easy. It won't be, uh, it won't be obvious. People think it's gonna be a huge party, but I don't know because it, it won't be so easy to, to, to reconnect and to, we, need, we will need time to share these experiences, to find the words, to share it with the others. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's the <laughs> no, no, no. Really that's good. Thank, you. Question. I'm Thank sorry. you so much, and it's good to think about the time after, and maybe a post-traumatic stress syndrome that will come out. What will people Probably. do? How the world will look like? Really, really. Thank you for giving us a real insight, both of you. I think we have a better feeling uh, 
about France, even so, of course, as you say, everybody is so very, very different in the experiences, but we've got a little, a little glimpse um, into it tomorrow. We have Guillermo Calderon from Chile, the great playwright who also has seen his country going through dramatic uh, changes, and he will talk to us next week. We have um, the German company, the Rimini Protocol, who through their work um, has questions the very foundations of theater, and I'm interested to know what they will think. They also say we are journalists in what or architects in the way what we do, and also theater makers, what, what, what they will have. Kirigis Jr. from uh, Haiti will uh, be with us, Jalila Bakar from Tunisia. Um, we will have Peter, Peter Sellers uh, uh, wonderfully, uh, you know, joined us uh, and uh, can't wait to hear what he has to say. Also next to the work, he's also working at universities. And then Oscar Eustace who runs the public theater, the great big theater, public theater in, uh, uh, in New York City. And uh, Tony Torn, an actor who runs a small theater out of his living room, out of his home with 20 seats. And so I think we will get also an, in, an insight in these different, different, different worlds. But um, Arthur, really, I know how much uh, you still have to work, how much is on your mind and how much you carry on your shoulder for your theater, your company, your own work, family. So thank you for, for sharing. Thanks for thank our you. listeners. And, today. And your project is really beautiful. I think it's it's amazing and it's really, uh, I mean, for all these students and all the people and all the, the students from CUNY and who have the opportunity to hear all these voices from all over the world. Thank you for organizing that because it's very rare, very exceptional, very important. And you have just amazing people, and um, and it's really beautiful. And Thank I take you. advantage to say hi to all my yeah. American friends. And, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you directed in Boston at the ART, and you have been uh, one of those who traveled. So I hope we will see you again here. And uh, we are working on a very uh, interesting things with. Uh, I I had, I had a, I did a work about Jean Genet called Splendid, a very unknown and beautiful mm -hmm. play with a group of different American actors from New York, but from everywhere, people I, I, I worked with. And Splendid was about uh, people having a no stage and confined in a hotel. And some of them said, it's so close to the work we've done, why don't you try it on Zoom? And so it was a way also to keep active and, and to connect with these actors that are very dear to my heart, but so far. Mm -hmm. And so we meet every week and we rehearse online. And we try to figure out how that text and the memory we have of the show can now work in the setup of Zoom. Because uh, yeah. one of the direction I was giving to the actors was like, say the line just like if you were trapped in your own cell or in your own self and try to communicate with all these guys in the other cells. And they were in the show when they could even see each other. It was very lonely, very um, inner voices. And, and it starts to make sense in this uh, reality when you have them all in all these little all the cells. And everybody frames. has the same space, the same democratization it, in a way. Exactly. Toshiki Okada from Japan said, you know, it's odd. He, the actor now he works with has the same space on the screen as he does as a director. And it's changing. So there are lots of things that are changing. The world already has changed radically. And um, so we will see how it all develops. Thank you. And my, maybe one day we we chime in again and uh, and good I luck with your work. And it's a fantastic series you're you doing in Rennes and I wish you all good luck. And uh, and uh, maybe it's inspiring for some of the New York theaters. So the idea is to, let's look at history, but the alternative, not the official one, closer to the real one and uh, good luck. And uh, thank you so for much. Howl Round for hosting at Vijay and uh, Thea and, um, and Vincent and uh, the Siegel team. Um, so um, talk to you soon and thank you all.